All right, everyone, thank you very much for hanging around. Um, sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, we have now Scott, another local uh, Tassie guy, to do another talk. Um, this time, uh, it is on Ethereum and dApps? Dapps. Dapps. Yep. Awesome. All right, so let's get through this bio. Scott spent his formative years running Linux and looking very hard for a forced daemon that should be checked whenever starting up after an unclean shutdown of hard drives. It wasn't until 2000 that he reluctantly agreed forced did not exist and has been face palming ever since that although the exploration into the kernel and Linux systems, um, it has likely led him to a successful career as a sysadmin and developer. He runs a local Tasmanian Linux users group meetings in Hobart. He likes to promote Libra open source products and, and uh, products and projects wherever he can and is, uh, whenever he can and is usually the right tool for the job. His work leads him to develop and manage enterprise networks, museum and theatre automation and home automation installations around Hobart and Tasmania. On weekends, he gets to play with his own home lab and amateur radio gear. Look forward to a lightning talk on that later for the other school's <laughs> lightning talk. Um, he jumped into the Bitcoin pool a couple of years ago when it was just starting to be noticed. Rather than making money, he's been fiddling with blockchain tech, realising uh, and the general coolness of decentralised distributed systems. So thank you very much, Scott. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, in the introduction there, I actually went looking for, in the first version of Linux, uh, a daemon called Force D, not realising that it was supposed to be pronounced Forced. Yeah, now you get the joke. <laughs> and uh, I only realised that five years later. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't get to play with uh, blockchain technology and uh, other stuff uh, during my day job because I'm usually in, uh, to connecting embedded systems to make them talk to each other, building management systems, things like that. So uh, this is one way for me to get out of my sort of headspace and do something else. Um, so I've only found Ethereum a couple of months ago. Uh, it's only been around for a, a year um, and uh, it's still sort of very early days and quite a moving target. So I thought I chose uh, Ethereum as a sort of a talking point and discovery uh, uh, and perhaps something that I could contribute uh, further down the track um, when I've got time, of course. Uh, so this uh, talk, I actually sort of started in the talk, uh, it's going to talk a bit about Bitcoin, um, mainly because it is the technology that under, underlies Ethereum. So it's uh, good to give a distribution on the uh, explanation of that technology before we sort of skip over to the general purpose computing of Ethereum. So I just thought I'd ask is, uh, what, uh, how many people have uh, used Bitcoins or have a Bitcoin wallet somewhere? Cool, all right. Um, and uh, just the thing, have you uh, just used it to send and receive uh, you know, Bitcoin? Uh, or have you used it for any other kind of transaction? No? Okay, cool. So basically, the under thing underlying Bitcoin is, a, is the blockchain, um, which is basically a data structure that uh, has a group of transactions um, and the, uh, each uh, block is actually referenced by the previous block and in each block is uh, basically a group of transactions in a data structure called a Merkle tree. Um, and I'm not gonna show pictures of Angel Merkle like another talk has done. <laughs> um, so where can we find blockchains today? Well, Bitcoin, um, uh, of course. and. Uh, Pretty much every other uh, alt uh, cryptocurrency, uh, some people call them uh, uh, bleep coins, <laughs> uh, Ripple, uh, and more recently, Ethereum. Um, and that's going to change uh, very, very soon as the financial industry have started to play the if you can't beat them, join them type thing, or at least steal their technology. Um, <laughs> So for years they've been putting down Bitcoin as an alternate currency. They're actually not really, they don't really care about that much anymore, but they're actually quite interested in the underlying blockchain technology and what it can do for their business. So at this point, I went to uh, find out, so you've got the blockchain, how do all of the nodes in the Bitcoin network uh, synchronize with them, each other and know how much your, bank, your wallet balance is? Uh, so I took a little bit of a tangent here and uh, I'll go through a, quite a few tangents as I, my attention sort of changes and goes, oh, cats or something. <laughs> uh, so the blockchain is a data store. So how do two, any two systems are, uh, stay consistent? Um, 
Now, it's been proven that any asynchronous system uh, cannot be guaranteed to have consistency. Uh, so we need to have a synchronous system to do that, and for that we need to actually have consensus between the nodes. Uh, so on top of the blockchain technology, the Bitcoin protocol uh, essentially specifies a, a way for all of the nodes of the network to um, say this is the right, the right fork, this is the, uh, the right block, uh, blockchain to keep uh, building upon. So, um, and so for, so consensus bring, uh, gives you uh, safety, so you know that your transactions are correct, and it also gives liveness so that basically you can say if uh, you know, a certain number of nodes fall off the network, you have essentially some, uh, safety conditions, I mean live conditions, so that the, the rest of the network can carry on without perhaps some of the more influential nodes in the network still you know, might have gone away temporarily. Um, so basically, if you don't have the latest block in the blockchain, you're not synchronized with the network. So you're essentially out of sync with the network, so you can't actually participate, you know, guarantee consistency of you know, the, da the data, that, uh, the transactions that have happened up until that point. So there's several ways of, that computer systems have tried to get consensus over the years. Um, the simplest one is the two-party consensus, and I'll try not to jump. It's basically, um, you know, I want to commit to something. The other guy goes, yes, you can commit, and the other guy and the, the original guy commits the um, the transaction. Um, and this works reasonably well, uh, but if a single node fails, it can actually block. So the other guy, can, you know, I want to commit something. The other guy's not there, or. I want to commit something. The other guy says, "Yeah, you can commit something." And by that time, the original guy's not there anymore. So the the consensus model gets blocked at that point. Um, so you could try three-party consensus. So um, you, first guy goes, "Can I commit?" The second guy goes, "Yes, you can commit." The third guy goes, "Okay, I'm committing." The the receiver goes, "Okay, I'm ready." And then the first, the then it gets uh, then the commit happens. And the, uh, the receiver goes, yep, I received it. Um, so this actually gets around that single node failure because there's more acknowledgments in the process. Um, but if the network's split in two, it basically, um, you don't actually know which one. Uh, when it rejoins, you don't actually know, where, where the, um, you know what to do in that situation because um, essentially you've got two, two blocks of transactions which, have, uh, which are different. Um, so uh, at that point, uh, a guy called Paxos. No. Paxos is an um, a ancient uh, Greek island. Uh, basically uh, developed uh, a way to have a quorum, you know, like a civilization would, of, of servers. And uh, so you would actually, clients would propose um, something to be changed. The, pro uh, the proposer would say, can we do that? Um, the acceptors will then accept that, and then once this whole process is complete, then uh, that moves across to the uh, the blockchain. So all of the other clients can then learn it. So in this case, um, you know, uh, servers would actually be given multiple roles. Uh, some of them are clients, some of them are uh, acceptors, and some of them, and pretty much everyone's a learner. Um, and this is actually used quite. It's actually quite. Uh, uh, Fault tolerant. Uh, it's got good, reasonably good performance. Uh, it's used in quite a few uh, systems out there at the moment, um, and uh, it was the basis of a lot of other consensus models when you're looking at distributed systems. Um, there were some issues with Paxos. Is I think there was some uh, perhaps uh, 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 patent or royalty issues of the uh, original designer. So essentially. A system called Raft has come up, uh, which is a completely open system that's come up uh, since Paxos. And Paxos might have been a good uh, uh, a distributed system model for, in theory, in, uh, but uh, uh, Raft actually um, brings out some uh, real world, more real world applications, uh, and uh, so that it. Uh, 
it's basically learnt some, from some of the mistakes that Paxos made in its original implementation, and it's also essentially completely open, uh, an open standard as well. Um, in a, so I'll just have a quick um, demonstration here of Hopefully this is going to work. Um, so that, that was basically the server then asking for a vote and votes coming back, yeah, uh, who can be the leader in uh, a raft consensus model. And so basically there's an elected leader and if the leader is responsible for sending out heartbeats, um, if heartbeat isn't received by the time the uh, circles come out, then essentially those uh, guys uh, ask, request a vote and uh, elect a new, a new leader, as in any good democracy. That's how it should work, shouldn't it? <laughs> I don't trust you anymore. Let's have another election. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's how we do things here as well, isn't it? Um, so that was my little tangent there on um, distributed systems. So uh, I basically went down that tangent so that, uh, as I said, I develop a whole lot of, of embedded systems that, that work, that need to work with each other. So perhaps some sort of uh, distributed protocol could be useful for me somewhere down the track. Um, so then I opened another browser tab and uh, found out that why people created systems like Ethereum and other alt currencies uh, is to get around some of the issues that are in the imperfect Bitcoin protocol. Uh, so Bitcoin, when you send some money for someone else, the other guy initially gets it uh, pretty quickly, um, but they can't, they can't really spend it. Um, straight away. They actually have to wait for a certain number of confirmations, like miners on the network uh, saying, yes, this uh, nodes on the network saying, yeah, this transaction is confirmed. And once uh, generally six, trans six confirmations have happened, then you can actually go and spend your money. So, uh, your Bitcoin. So, I, uh, um, I sent, uh, yesterday before this talk, just uh, as a demo, uh, I went and bought some Bitcoin. Uh, and so, a new block happens every six minutes, and so six, trend, uh, six trend confirmations later, so about half an hour, I was able to spend, spend my money. So, oh, actually, the Bitcoin uh, blockchain is every 10 minutes. Sorry. So after about an hour, my Bitcoin was then ready to be spent. <coughs> um, so obviously, this isn't fast enough for one of the users that everyone wants to use Bitcoin for, microtransactions, um, you know, sending lots of little bits for micro you know, microservices as well. So um, the idea is that uh, um, the Bitcoin protocol be expanded to use sidechains, which is basically another, uh, another blockchain that goes, which uh, you send Bitcoins to the sidechain, the sidechain does some stuff with it, you know, with that service. And then when, whenever it is needed, the, the sidechain is essentially, you know, the Bitcoins essentially appear back on the blockchain from the sidechain. So that's not in the protocol at the moment. Uh, but Rusty uh, is working as part of um, uh, Bitstream to work on this sidechain called Alpha. Um, and so that will involve basically reassigning one of the opcodes that the, Bitco the Bitcoin virtual machine uses to actually have a new opcode called sidechain verify. So you can actually verify that the Bitcoins uh, put on the, this sidechain are actually valid. Um, so they actually do this. The process that happens is uh, similar to like if you're a Python developer, you've got the Py uh, PEP, Python Enhancement Process. Um, uh, you've got the Bitcoin Improvement Process here. And so you, it's like an, a request for comment. You make a thing, everyone, you make a, a proposal, everyone argues about it, everyone flames each other over it. Uh, um, and for things like you know, blockchain, the Bitcoin becoming uh, actually quite large and the blocks, uh, each block is actually getting uh, filled up. Uh, so the one meg block side is not uh, big enough to hold all the transactions. So um, someone's actually sort of saying, well, let's make it eight meg or some arbitrary number like that. Uh, but unfortunately that, uh, and so they've actually submitted this um, improvement uh, request and uh, the, but people with the, have got vested interests already and they don't want things to change. So it actually became a bit of a flame war. It's still going on. Um, 
but uh, so, but that's essentially the process of act, you know improving the or changing the Bitcoin protocol. So uh, you would actually uh, need to create um, a fork of the um, what's called a hard fork, so that at the time of the hard fork, any transactions further on may not be valid uh, on older clients. So sort of everyone has to move at once. Um, so yeah, uh, so we actually had, you know, for example, the, the new eight meg block size has been sort of incorporated into this thing called Bitcoin XT. Um, and so if you were a miner and you wanted to run Bitcoin XT, uh, so when 75% of the miners all, all were running this, uh, Bitcoin XT was gonna activate and allow eight meg blocks to happen. Well, someone obviously didn't like that, so they actually went around and saw miners or full nodes running Bitcoin XT and started dosing them because for some reason they didn't want the process to go ahead. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so yeah, for, th for things like that, like these kind of uh, big changes that happen to Bitcoin protocol, uh, they are very thoroughly discussed with the core, core members and uh, before the things are acted upon. Um, and so as part of the Bitcoin main network, you can actually only do about four to five different transactions. Um, send money, receive money, look up balances, uh, sign, sign things. Um, on the Bitcoin test net, you actually get access to a lot more opcodes uh, and transactions, um, but they won't work if you do the same transactions on the main net. So you can go on the test net and develop your, your new wonderful application that's gonna transform Bitcoin and probably have it rejected by the, the main guys because all they wanna do is send and receive money or things like that, so. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, sorry. So yeah, um, so I just went uh, on a bit of a tangent there about uh, sort of uh, Bitcoin sidechains. Um, and the reason uh, why uh, the sidechains uh, might, be, uh, might be public or they might be private, and whether or not that's a good thing. Um, well, basically the technologies of you know, Bitcoin is MIT licensed and Ethereum is uh, GPL licensed. Uh, so in, in, uh, the idea is that if uh, Bitcoin originally started and it, wasn't, it was a closed source protocol, you know, uh, a crypto standard, would you actually be able to trust it that your transactions were valid? Um, that's part of the uh, reason why um, Bitcoin has had its relative success is that basically you can uh, look at the code and uh, verify that yourself that things are happening as they should. Um, that means that doesn't mean that business and proprietary things have a no role to play. Um, so there's been a lot of interest recently of um, banks like UP, uh, UBS and uh, some of the Australian banks actually running, starting to run their own blockchain um, uh, re research and development uh, solutions to, for possible future uh, applications. And um, the, the reason for that, uh, that is I, I think a good thing, is that it actually spreads adoption for blo blockchain technology. Um, bugs can be found in a private blockchain and then essentially patched in the public blockchain. Um, Eventually, some of these private chains will be connected to the public blockchains via um, side chains and things like that. Uh, and that means that when we get to things like ap applications on Ethereum, that um, blockchain, these private applications can actually get a public release at some point. So they can coexist peacefully. Um, <coughs> just as a uh, sort of side note, so when you when you send money or Bitcoin uh, to someone else, it actually, you create a transaction. The transaction has a series of opcodes. So you're actually running essentially you know, bytecodes on the Bitcoin virtual machine. So I've got here a, a little uh, editor, which actually you can see how uh, a Bitcoin virtual machine transaction might work. So here we've got three, three codes, one, two, and op add. So uh, it's interesting to note that Bitcoin is a, um, a stack-based system, so the first time thing you would actually push one onto the stack, then you push two onto the stack, and then you do the add, which pulls those two off, and pushes the result back onto the stack. Um. So, 
So, um, yeah, two. Let me just show you another one here. So, I mean, this, uh, again, um, it's basically just going to do a subtract thing. Um, puts two onto the stack, puts another two onto the stack, subtract, subtracts them, and it's zero. So basically, it's then going to do an if. <laughs> um, and of course, it uh, then will um, put three, you know, because uh, it's the else condition there, because you know, zero. Um, so essentially, when you send a transaction to send some money on the network, you're actually sending a bunch of opcodes that says, you know, uh, take this money from my, you know, spend this money from this, from this Bitcoin and add it to this, point, this wallet over here. Um, another thing, interesting thing that people have been wanting to do, they've been wanting to essentially add extra information to the Bitcoin blockchain that to, to make Bitcoin be able to do other things that it wasn't necessarily designed for. So there was this opcode called op return, which you can actually return an arbitrary string of data, 44 bytes. Um, and so people have been using this to uh, essentially what was called colored coins. They say this little bit of Bitcoin is worth, you know, this little bit of Bitcoin, but it also means that I own this car or something. So that if I send that colored coin over to someone else, then they own that car. <laughs> so. Um, but at the same time, you can actually put anything in the op, retu op return. Uh, and um, just uh, give me a second here. And I, I, do, I just wanted to do this for you know, fun and games. Uh, and uh, stupid word pad. Um, so wrote a little script, um, which basically creates a real transaction, uh, sending myself you know, to another wallet some money. Uh, I took that transaction out and basically substituted a quick one that said, do op return and a message. Uh, then I waited the 10 or 15 minutes for the blockchain to, um, to happen, uh, to synchronize. And down here, I uh, added little string of text to the blockchain that's going to be there forever. <laughs> because reasons. <laughs> um, I want to say... I would have known this a month ago uh, because I actually had to write a decoder. I think it was... I want to say it's a UTF something, but um, it's, it escapes me right now. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, UT I think it's pretty sure it's UTF-8 because you can do some special characters as, as well. Um, so if you go to uh, coinsecrets.org, I think it is, um, this basically lists uh, all of the stuff that's been in op return. You know, so other applications are using op return and how they're using it. And most of it's encoded stuff that you can't read. Yeah. So now to the what I was actually going to talk about. Um, <laughs> so uh, Ethereum. So you've got the whole part of blockchain uh, of, of Bitcoin there, what Bitcoin can do. As you can see, Bitcoin can add, it can sub sub subtract, it can do if, it can't do loops. Uh, so it's very, very limited set of uh, opcodes that are actually valid on there. So people were thinking, well, what if there's a way we can actually make a Turing complete virtual machine that ran a blockchain? So nodes get added to the blockchain and everyone's running the same code. All of the transactions you send to the blockchain are cryptographically uh, signed and, um, and basically verifiable. Uh, so right now, as I said, it's in a beta. Uh, it's called Ethereum Frontier. Uh, originally, it was Ethereum uh, Olympus, like the ancient stuff. That was the test net that w was thrown out uh, a few months ago, I think August. Um, so now it's Frontier. It's a, it is a live net, 
but it, uh, they've crossed out the word safe for now until they actually get it a little bit more um, secure. They've had a few sort of um, see, uh, security notifications and basically the original developers have got some canaries, canary code in there which basically says, oh, something's wrong and make sure that everyone upgrades. And in, in this sort of early thing uh, process, uh, if uh, they, the protocol can actually deal, say, if your um, client is too old, it'll actually just stop communicating with you until you, you upgrade. And I actually left a, a node running for since last month when I actually rehearsed this talk at uh, Linux users group meeting and uh, came logged it on a couple of days ago and yeah the the geth console was basically saying nothing's happening <laughs> um, so um, so it's a blockchain it's Turing complete so that means you could essentially run anything someone in Reddit asked the other day could you run Linux <laughs> on Ethereum uh, some everyone answered why would you want to <laughs> Uh, yeah, so basically in a few, a few months or maybe uh, six to 12 months, they'll, they'll move from front, uh, Frontier to Metropolis, uh, which will basically be a bit more feature complete, a lot more stable. And, um, and then finally Serenity, where they'll make some changes to things like using uh, proof of work to proof of stake to, and, other, and uh, app, there'll be more applications ready to go on that. Um, so. With Bitcoin, you had to wait 10 minutes for a confirmation. Right now, with Ethereum, you have to wait 15 seconds. So right now, you submit, you, you do a procedure call to the uh, Bitcoin blockchain, I mean, Ethereum blockchain, you, you wait 15 seconds before you get a response. Obviously, for computing, that's not very fast right now. But as I said, still beta. Um, and they, they plan to actually get it down to one second blocks uh, later on. Um, and they're going to switch to proof of stake rather than um, proof of work, which is how Bitcoin works, solving this really difficult, complicated puzzle to confirm blocks. Um, so the components of Ethereum. So you've got the blockchain and the virtual machine. So there's been an app written on it called Whisper, which is basically secure um, secret messaging, encrypted messaging, which basically your messages get encrypted, put on the blockchain, and so only the recipient with the, the right private key can uh, can also look at the block uh, at that message. Um, what doesn't exist yet is Swarm. It's basically another blockchain that will have uh, storage, so that you can basically host the assets for your application on it. Um, and then finally, someone's essentially, they're, they're basically going to take a, you know, a web browser and add a bunch of uh, sort of JavaScript ready to go on it to essentially run uh, an Ethereum node so you can just look at the blockchain. You don't actually have to load assets from the web and you can browse for decentralized a assets. Um, so, slight tangent again, <laughs> uh, because I went looking for information about this swarm thing and found that it didn't really exist yet. There's been a few white papers on it. Um, so, the people are writing dApps, and they're called dApps because they're decentralized apps. Um, the, you need ways to store your assets, um, like uh, images and the, the HTML and the JavaScript that. And so uh, right now people are using the IPFS, the Interplanetary File System. <laughs> and um, <coughs> show you, oh, I can't, unfortunately I can't give you a quick look on that because it was running on my Linux box. But basically uh, it's uh, written in Go, uh, so you can actually just download the binary and run it. Um, and uh, it's as simple as uh, running the daemon, IPFS daemon. And then you can uh, go IPFS, you know, cat or LS. Then um, it also does snapshots. So you can actually say, you know, look at your code at this snapshot. And when you're ready to release a new one, you can um, just change the, the hash of, this, uh, of the snapshot and, every, and your app will point to the new one there. So that, uh, uh, and basically the idea is you, it's uh, peer-to-peer. It's -peer, so you basically put your files onto the IPFS and a few minutes later, you'll actually see them actually appear. Maybe if you go to ipfs.io, um, they actually have a gateway on their website, and you can actually do, do a hash lookup and get and receive that same file from their website rather than you know, your local file store. And I think there's also a fuse mount for it, so ipfs mount will actually then mount it as slash ipfs. Yeah. Uh, 
Cool. So um, what would you want this nebulous, decentralized virtual machine that can run anything, even Linux, if someone wanted to port it to it? Um, what, would, uh, what kind of apps would you want to run on that? And um, right now, a lot of the developers are still thinking along the terms of uh, Bitcoin uh, type of applications, things like prediction markets, uh, which might also be called betting markets. <laughs> Uh, they say it's the, the wisdom of the crowd and put your money where your mouth is type thing. Um, but some other interesting things have happened. Recently, um, I, I found a, a crowdfunding. Um, so people are looking to crowdfund the next stage of, of a prediction market, actually. <laughs> um, a development of that. And so people could actually send some of their ether which they'd bought to, um, to this uh, crowdfunded application they'd written. And if it got enough, then the person that would, you know, that started the crowdfunding application would get the ether sent to them uh, when the campaign finished. Otherwise, all of the ether would get sent back to the original people. So that's one of the applications. Uh, so Augur is the prediction market which I've been talking about. And uh, Augur.net, it's actually one of the more advanced applications out there at the moment. So you can actually run it uh, on their demo server, or you can run an instance of it yourself. Um, and uh, the idea with, with Augur, the prediction market, you would um, uh, say, you know, tomorrow it's going to rain. <laughs> Other people will go, yeah, it's going to rain. And they'll put some ether on that as well, which basically will move how much the yes or no value of that is going to, you know, the odds essentially is going to happen. And then so tomorrow happens, um, the the, the dateline passes, so that, that thing closes. You have then a, a number of other entities on the on the network, the organ network, who are reputation, who have reputation, and they can say yes, it did rain, or no, it didn't rain. And of course, if you go against the flow, then you'll lose reputation. Um, there's a mechanism for that. Now, this has been in development for about six six months, quite early on, and it's still not quite released yet. Basically, because they need to ensure that there's no flaw in the logic of not, not bugs in the application because they can be fixed, but basically that there's no flaw in the, their, their pro, the system, their protocol, um, basically so that people can't game the system or you know, have heaps of reputation and, and influence it and things like that. So that's why it hasn't quite come for public, uh, public use yet, but it's, it's close. So hmm. um, The other one that's interesting uh, on the horizon is boardroom.to. Um, collaborative, transparent um, organization. Uh, so you can actually uh, give the directors tokens, uh, which are backed by Ether, and they can, um, you know, they can use that to vote in, oh, put forward proposals, and um, and then they can, uh, then they can put, after they put forward proposals, they can, you know, vote on them and things like that, and assign budgets. So if you want to get started, um, you can go and install the tools. Uh, I recommend the top two. There's ETH, which is C++, and Geth, which is Go-based. Um, people have written their own implementations because they wanted to understand how the protocol works. Um, I would recommend you go to ethereum.org and uh, have a look at the documentation. Um, and once you install it, you create your wallet address and send it some Ether. Um, I there's some instructions on the website as well for creating a test net so you don't actually have to spend real ether and real money which you have to buy with Bitcoin. Um, and that way you can give as much ether as you want. <laughs> um, it's, uh, so when you go to the Geth console, it's basically a JavaScript console. And so there's all of these JavaScript uh, app objects which you can in interact with. Um, and over time, I built myself up a little JavaScript library of things to send money quickly here and there. Uh, so you, you can just do a load script and load your own JavaScript there. Um, so how do you add your code to the blockchain? Well, that's actually quite easy. There's a couple of languages. There's Solidity, which is their own language. And the other one is Serpent, which is actually neutered Python with a few changes. There's no classes on it yet. Um, there's size limitations of 256 bits. Um, but other than that, you can actually write reasonably concise Python and have it appear on the blockchain as code. Um, so here's an example of a quick hello world. 
Um, so you've got, as you can see, this is solidity. So we've got two contracts, and they're both objects. So there's a mortal. I've created a mortal object. Um, basically, it's an object that can be killed. So you can actually, if you do this, you can actually say that this object will no longer exist on the blockchain afterwards, or will no longer be able to be referenced on the blockchain. And then the second one I created is uh, the greeter, um, which basically assigns a string, and then you can retrieve the string just like, you know, get and set command right there. Um, so yeah, I'll just give you a quick, uh, quick demo of that. Um, if uh, this is going to work, might have left it too long. No, unfortunately, that uh, SSH connection's uh, finished. Uh, decided it's not going to. So what I'll do instead is um, have a quick look here. So I wrote a, a quick, um, quick and dirty voting object. So you could actually send it a question and some responses. So like, you know, what's your favorite OSDC talk, and have all the responses there, and then other people can connect connect to that object, register to vote, and then vote for it, and you can get results. So you've got, essentially, it's just an, an object just like you would actually write similar to, um, similar to JavaScript. Um, uh, then how do you get that in there? Um, what you need to do is essentially use that, uh, the, the JavaScript um, console to um, Compile the to compile the uh, the solidity into a bytecode, and uh, then you'll actually it'll you'll get after you load this script you'll get ref, uh, an, a uh, in this case a greeter object which you can go greeter dot greet and work with it just as you would normally. So this might seem a little as you can see here on the the second line and the top line there you pretty much have to put that entire source code before into a one liner. Um, so it can be a bit funky there, um, but it actually shows how you would manually create you know, objects on the blockchain. So um, how, how do you do this in a web world? Well, it's actually Embark, um, and people are also using Media because that's actually a client, a server push mechanism. Um, and unfortunately, that's also running on my Linux uh, box. But basically, if you have a look at Embark, once you do a um, Embark and new app name, you'll get a um, uh, this directory structure here, and you can put all of your Solidity or Python stuff in the contracts thing, uh, put a, all your HTML, um, and the HTML, uh, basically, the Java, uh, the J, the, in the JS directory, you'll actually get, uh, it will give you um, scripts that will present the contracts that you've made up. It will compile those contracts and give you JavaScript objects so you can actually interact with them. Um, in, in the DOM, just like a normal web app you would do. Uh, so uh, then you can actually specify contracts. As you know, there's actually missing from there is also a test directory, uh, so you can actually write your own tests. So it's actually a reasonably well thought out framework um, to write uh, applications in for the web. Um, but I recommend actually going and using the console bit first so you actually get the hang of what's actually happening behind the scenes. Um, yeah, so, so it, uh, it's pretty much the tip of the iceberg, and businesses are taking an interest, so we, we'll um, see what uh, the future has uh, to hold in Ethereum in about a year when it gets out of, out of beta. Oh. Cool. Thank much, Thanks. <laughs> so we're going to move on. We're going to move on to the next talk, um, but...